Hello, hello. Oh, 12. I love, I love starting these town halls and seeing the numbers zoom up. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, this is uh, Zateo Town Hall for founding members. I want to say my name is Mehdi Hassan, but I hope you know that at this point, because it'd be weird if you didn't, but I appreciate if you didn't know me, but still signed up for $500 a year. Thank you so much to you guys. You guys are the founding members. You guys are the backbone of this new media company, Zateo, uh, that I launched um, a couple of weeks ago, soft launched. Uh, the formal launch is in April. I keep reminding everyone, middle of April, we're going to be rolling out shows, podcasts, essays, op-eds, some great contributors from America and around the world. So we're really excited to have your support. Couldn't do any of this without you because, as I've said before, free press isn't free. You've got to pay for journalism. Um, so we're investing in studios. We're investing in contributors. We're investing in online content. And I hope you see it all uh, with your, I hope you appreciate it all. Uh, when it rolls out. Okay, so we're in a town hall. We have till five o'clock Eastern, which is where I am. I'm in the DC area. Let's have a look at your questions. Um, as the email that went out told you, at some point soon, I hope to get smaller groups of you so we can actually chat uh, on camera, one to one or one to 50. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna read out your questions because there's already 60 of you and I believe there's another 100 coming along at some point. So let's have a look at the Q and A. If you've got questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, Musa Al Talibi goes first. Uh, stick your questions in the chat. We will. I've got some team members here to help me uh, get through them. Uh, Musa asks for professionals who have some expertise that might be able to elevate Zateo in some way, uh, whether in production or planning. What is the best way to connect with the right people within the organization? Great question. We've had loads of people reaching out to us. It's so. Um, it is amazing to see the support we've had from around the world. People volunteering their time, offering money, offering skills, asking for jobs. I would say for now. Uh, email info uh, at zateonews.com. Uh, that is a good place to contact our team. Someone will get back to you, especially if you've got a uh, skill set to offer. We'll try our best. We're a small, scrappy startup, uh, and we're trying to uh, uh, get through the next few weeks as we're ready for launch. Still waiting for some more questions. Um, till then, Charlie Henderson, I don't know if he's on the call, it emailed earlier before we started, asking about my book, Win Every Argument, uh, that came out last year in hardback, came out recently in paperback. And he asked about how it is that when I'm in a debate, not only do I follow all the tips and techniques, but I memorize lots of facts. And his question was, how do you bring, how do you memorize those facts and then recall them? It's a great question. I've Touch wood, touch lots of wood. I've always had a good memory. Um, uh, my kids have a good memory now, maybe inherited. It's as I get grayer, the memory is slowing down. But um, the simple solution, it's just practice. I have a whole chapter in the book called practice. And the same applies to memorizing things. When I've given speeches, when I've done comments off the cuff, when I've done 60 second rants, or when I've you know produced a statistic as a mic drop in a debate, it's because I've spent a lot of time going through it beforehand. Moments before I go in, I'll be looking at notes. Moments before I stand up at a podium, I'll be looking at my notes. Um, days before an event, I will be trying to think about what do I need to know? What are the key facts? If I've got a great one-liner, can I memorize it so it sounds smooth? So it really is just practice, nothing other than that, to be honest. Um, Taha Yeselhark asks, what is the end goal for Zateo? The final aim. I don't know what the final aim is because I don't think that long in the future. But the end goal, I guess, uh, is to try and have an impact on our media landscape, both domestic and foreign, to show folks how it's done, to show that we can do journalism in an honest, productive, uh, combative, confrontational way with integrity and honesty. We can do it. There's no reason we shouldn't do it. Um, and that is the goal of Zateo, to try and set a good example for everyone else. Um, Rosie Homeyer asks, no one seems to ask about um, the possibility of Western leaders, media moguls being blackmailed by Israel's secret service, which could explain their unwavering support for a plausible genocide, to quote the ICJ. Uh, um, are people being blackmailed? I don't see any evidence for that. I mean, secret services do weird things. The CIA, the Mossad, um, the MI6 have done lots of dodgy stuff over the years. I think it's worse than that, though. I know we sometimes want to believe in some kind of hidden thing going on. It's actually much simpler than that. The reality is that the people in power, um, a lot of them don't give a damn about people abroad. 
And a lot of them are easily lobbied, easily persuaded, easily bullied and intimidated, not in secret, but out in the open. I mean, a lot of the bullying that we've seen since October the 7th has happened publicly, the bullying of college presidents, of newspaper journalists, of members of Congress. You look at APAC dropping millions of dollars openly. They don't do this in secret. APAC is saying, we're going to go after Jamal Bowman. We're going to go after Cory Bush. Um, and you're now seeing some Democrats pushing back and saying no to APAC. So I do think we don't need to always worry about what's happening behind the scenes. There is stuff happening behind the scenes. But we also just need to see what's happening openly, what Netanyahu says openly, what Joe Biden does openly, what Donald Trump is threatening openly, what lobby groups are doing, what arms manufacturers are doing. It is happening in plain sight. Um, anonymous attendee asks, are you planning on still covering long COVID? Yes, I hope to. Probably not straight away because there's so much going on right now in Gaza with the election. But definitely COVID is a story that I've tried to cover a great deal when I was at MSNBC. I covered it when a lot of other journalists stopped covering it. It's a huge problem. It's a huge blight, sadly, on our society an illness that is a, a mass disabling event in many ways and it's being ignored by the people in power by our medical community and of course by the media um t keita asks i want to know what contributed your bringing along t keita you're gonna have to wait my friend because we're not rolling those names out until middle of april we've got to keep something back right for the big launch um it is a surprise lots of journalists keep asking me can you name any of them we're not naming any of them yet. We're going to roll out a few names mid-April, and then we're going to hold some more back. We've got quite a few, and they're really good names. They're really interesting people. They're really powerful voices. They're people you admire, I'm sure. Um, let's keep moving. Uh, we've only got a limited time, and dozens of you are asking questions. Um, Gwen Hibbs says, is American political journalism uniquely awful, i.e. Trump versus Biden? <sighs> That is a good question. I don't know if it's uniquely awful, but it, it's certainly awful right now. And compared to a lot of other countries, it is more sensationalist. It is more both sides. It is more obsessed with access. It is more deferential. Here's my biggest critique of American political journalists. Super deferential. We treat the people in power as if they're uh, either they're our friends, so we're like kind of all chummy and friendly, or they're somehow above us and we have to kind of bow down and bow and scrape. The president comes in the room and the White House press corps stands up. That doesn't happen in the UK. Uh, that would be hilarious if Rishi Sunak walked into a room and the entire media press corps in the UK stood up. It's just, we need to have less deference in our journalism. We need to be really holding the people in power to account and be much more confrontational in our approach. Um, Arib Nasir asks, minority perspectives generally seem to be missing in most debates on most issues. What can be done to get minority voices into those uh, important social and political issues? Huge issue. Great question. The American media is still super, super white. Elite media, uh, television, print, uh, the C-suites. Um, so number one, we need to get more people from minority communities getting into the media. Uh, getting into the media corporate world too, getting into positions of influence, decision-making, that needs to happen. Uh, number two, um, we need to also be able to do our own thing. This is why I've set up Zeteo, partly to give uh, a, a, a diverse set of people uh, a platform. The contributors I'm bringing on are ethnically diverse. Uh, they're diverse in multiple ways, ideologically, politically, uh, geographically, gender. Um, so race, religion, or the whole the whole thing. So we need people who are willing to go out and actually platform people from different walks of life, which is what I hope to try and do. Um, and then, of course, minority representative general members of the public. You can put pressure on the people in power, on media corporations, on the newspapers you read to try and produce, uh, you know, a, a media and political elite in America or in Britain or in France or in Canada that looks like the country it's supposed to be serving. All right, Mawa Mustafa, uh, how can we help you? What areas do you need help in? And when can we expect a signed copy of your book? I'd already bought your book, but wasn't going to give up the chance to get a signed copy. Mawa, thanks so much. I appreciate that. We did put that in as an initial offer for the first, I think, what, 500 founding members. Uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds, we've had more than 500 founding members. I shouldn't be giving that intel away, but we have. It's been amazing. Um, I now have to sit and sign more than 500 books. I thought we'd get like 100 founding members or 50. And I can just sign that in a weekend. Now I've got to sign 500 because you guys are amazing. And Moa, we will, I will, once we get the launch out of the way, I will sit down, where's my Sharpie? And I will start going at it and you will get it, I, I promise you. Um, but just please give me some time, patience. Um, appreciate your support. That's the support I need. Um, Hasham Hasabala, Salams Ramadan Mubarak. Great book. Um, such a dilemma in this election. Trump is a disaster. And how can I face God after voting for Biden? What is your feeling? Um, Hasham Hasabala, I feel like I know that name. Did you used to write online about Islam politics? I know that name. Um, 
It's a great question. Wherever I go, Muslim voters in America in particular keep asking me this question. Who do we vote for? How do we vote for uh, Joe Biden, given the complicity in genocide? But we can't really vote for Donald Trump, given he's Donald Trump. I try not to tell people how to vote. What I do tell people is think about what needs to be thought about before you vote. I'd like to I, I worry that people are going to vote instinctively, emotionally, in a knee jerk way. And I get people are emotional. I'm emotional. We're all upset and angry. If you're not upset and angry about a genocide, What's wrong with you? But, you know, at the end of the day, sadly, we have a two party system in this country. I get people who say, you know, third party, vote third party, but that's they're not going to be president. The president next year, January 20th, 2025, either Joe Biden or Donald Trump was standing at the Capitol being sworn in. The question you have to ask yourself is, who do you want that person to be? Because we can opt out of the election. We can say we don't want to vote. We can say plague on both your houses. Doesn't matter. One of those two men is going to be president and is going to have huge impact on this country and the world for the next four years. So I would work backwards from January 20th, 2025. And I know people don't like the lesser of evils conversation, but it's one we're going to have to have at some point. Um, we have uh, Zeki Mokhtazada asking a question. Uh, can you give us Zeteo's top three to five achievements so far and your next two to three major milestones? Wow, that is a serious uh, uh, entrepreneurial question. Um, top three achievements so far for Zeteo. Number one, everyone's pronouncing it correctly, apart from Brian Lehrer on WNYC, Chris Cuomo, Jake Tapper, um, lots of the hosts and shows I've been going on to promote it, they've been saying the name right. And I can tell you, me and my team are worried about picking this ancient Greek name, which means to search out, to seek for the truth. Um, and they are answering it well. Um, uh, they're pronouncing it well. Uh, number two, the media itself. We've had great positive media coverage. And you might think a small scrappy startup like ours, which has a mission statement that says we're going to challenge media coverage. We're going to try and do journalism better. You might think everyone would turn on us. But actually, interestingly, we've had very positive coverage uh, from everyone uh, who's, who's looked at us. And number three, I think the big achievement we had is we put out our first sit down interview in Washington, D.C. this week, the interview with the South African foreign minister, Dr. Naledi Pandor. If you haven't seen it, it's on the website. It's on Zeteo.com. By the way, it's not ZeteoNews.com. We now have the domain, Zeteo.com, Z-E-T-E-O.com. Go to the website, watch the interview with Naledi Pandor. It's a very powerful interview. She talks about what's happening in Gaza. She talks about what's driving her. She talks about what she expects from the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. She says there should be an arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu. The fact that a South African foreign minister would sit down with little old Zetea before we've even formally launched, I think it's a pretty good endorsement of what we're doing and what we're about to do. And in terms of future milestones, I would say to Zeki, more big interviews, uh, more speaking truth to power, bigger and better media coverage, a successful launch in April. We've got a big launch coming up. And I think, again, six months down the line, as the election approaches, people are coming to us for honest, blunt, non-both sides coverage. All right, let's keep going. It's 4.45. Um, Ahmed Raza, last Zoom, you said many journalists were afraid to speak out about the injustice against the Palestinian people. Why? How to change that? Oh, that's a big question, Ahmed. I think there are many reasons why journalists are afraid to speak out. Uh, number one, they worry about their careers. They worry about being smeared as anti-Semites. Uh, they worry about uh, being pigeonholed if they're a brown journalist or a Muslim journalist as the Middle East person. Um, it's all stuff I've had to deal with over the years. Um, and what do we do about it? How do we change that? I think we need to, again, plug Zetea, provide platforms for people to be able to speak freely about contentious issues like Israel-Palestine, but also people in the mainstream media need to be encouraged, the people who do good work. You know what we do? I often say to, I often say to kind of Muslim audiences who, who kind of get worked up about Palestinian issues and media failures, we see bad coverage and we get super mad and we condemn the journalists or maybe we write an email complaining. But when there's positive coverage, do we always support the journalists doing good work? There are a lot of journalists out there doing amazing work, both on the ground, uh, here in the US, in the UK. There are people speaking truth to power. There are people uh, highlighting the plight of the Palestinians. Do we support them? Do we, do we send them a note? Do we praise them? Do we praise their bosses for having them? I think we need to think positively as well, not just negatively. All right, um, let's go to uh, Shachi Shah. Uh, what are you focused on right now in terms of the current political issues? What is your strategy for addressing the threat of authoritarianism in this country? It's a great question, Shachi. Um, it's one of the reasons I, I set up uh, Zeteo. I believe that fascists are at the door uh, across the Western world, not just the Western world, across the world. You look at India, where Modi's up for re-election. Um, you look at Saudi Arabia, for example, MBS. You look at Russia, where Putin just got re-elected in a free and fair election. <laughs> um, what is my plan? My plan is to speak as loudly 
as regularly and as relentlessly as I can about the authoritarian threat. I think you'll see when Zetero has its full launch, we will have a lot of unique content laying out what's coming, especially from the Trump camp. People don't quite realize how bad the second term of Trump is going to be. It's not going to be Trump one. It's going to be Trump one on steroids. It's going to be Trump one completely unrestricted. No adults in the room, no guardrails. Uh, and, and we're going to really explore what's being promised, what's being threatened. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, Ifran, Ifrana Zafar, I believe in the UK. What are your current thoughts on the Labour Party? Have they underestimated the Muslim vote? It's a good question. People are having the same discussion in the US. I think in the UK, the, uh, the difference is it's not going to be a close election. In the US, Muslims in Georgia or Michigan, Arab Americans could actually play a crucial role. In the UK, sadly, given the implosion of the Conservative Party, you can't keep track of how many prime ministers they've had. The Labour Party is pr pretty much a shoe in to win. And my good friend Owen Jones just quit the Labour Party this week. The Guardian column is saying, look, vote for independents, vote for Greens, where you can put pressure on this very centrist and in some way centre right Labour Party. Um, because, look, there's no danger of letting the Tories in, unlike in the US, where if you do vote third party, you could let Trump in. So that is one strategy that Owen's offering. Uh, has the Labour Party underestimated? Probably in terms of the anger, but they probably also factored in that we can win without them. Um, the current Labour Party is very disappointing. It's, uh, it's, it's super bureaucratic, super centrist, super managerialist, uninspiring. And on Gaza, it took a, a morally abhorrent position. Now Keir Starmer went on, I think, on Jeremy Vine's show this week in the UK and said, well, now I support a ceasefire. And when he was asked, why don't you support it then? Well, now all these people have died. Yeah, but if you'd supported it then, then they wouldn't have died. It's a kind of weird position to say I support a ceasefire now after I watched 30,000 people die. Um, morally untenable. Okay, let's keep going. Um, Heba Eliotti asked a great best question of all. How can we help you? Very simple. Get your friends to sign up to Zeteo. It, it's literally a subscription model. It's a numbers game. We need to get as big an audience as possible to have as much impact as possible and to fund the work we do. You guys are founders. You're the best subscribers of all. Please get your friends to be subscribers as well. Founding members would be great. Um, that, it's a very simple request. Sorry to keep banging on about it. Enver Sebi says, you've spoken extensively about Islam and its portrayal in Western media. What do you think are the most common misconceptions? How can they be addressed? I mean, the most common misconception, of course, is that we are foreign, right? Before you get to, are you violent? Are you terrorists? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's the idea that we are not part of the West. We are spoken of as they, us and them. Uh, we are spoken of as some kind of foreign entity, as if we're not part of the mainstream. Muslim Americans, British Muslims, Canadian Muslims, we are part and parcel of this country. Many of us go back decades. In the United States, I say this to my fellow brown folks, the DC folks, the immigrants. You know, we talk about our oh, Muslims, we're immigrants, we've been here a few generations. No, actually, black Muslims, who we often ignore in our mosques and take for granted and don't give leadership positions to, black Muslims have been in the United States since the beginning of this country. Black Muslims helped build this country, right? 15, 20, 25 percent of the slaves who were brought over forcibly from Africa were Muslim helped build the United States of America. So when we talk about the Muslim experience, um, yeah, we're seen as the other, which is completely false, and we need to push back against that. And then, of course, it's we're violent, we're terrorists, we're seen in Hollywood movies and TV shows. And for a while, we got away from that, but I feel post-October 7th, we're heading back into that territory of just being demonized uh, in popular culture as kind of the criminal, the terrorist, the violent folks. And we have to push back, and Zeteo will be pushing back. Um, Abbas Mirza says, considering the substantial duties of the presidency, it's crucial to prioritize uh, transparency regarding country leaders' mental health and well-being. Could you provide insight into the established protocols? There are none, Abbas. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it, right? In certain jobs, in certain military positions, you have to take certain tests, show that you're medically fit to work, to fly a plane, to, to be commander-in-chief of the United States, to have your finger on the nuclear button. You don't have to do anything. It's kind of crazy. So right now we have a very elderly president, two elderly candidates running for president. Uh, people are questioning Joe Biden's mental and physical fitness, uh, which is legitimate. It's not an illegitimate debate. I think it's exaggerated. Uh, and I think it's crazy when you're on the other side, you have an actual crazy person, Donald J. Trump, a man who goes, a man who goes around bragging about his dementia test. He's like, I said, man, person, woman, camera, TV, or whatever it was. And he thinks that was some great thing because he passed a dementia test. Um, he clearly is someone who is unhinged in many ways. And yeah, I would like to see tests done. I also think for the American audience watching, the age limit in the constitution is weird, right? You can't run for president unless you're 35. Maxwell Frost, 20-something uh, congressman from Florida, is not allowed to run for president. But you, there's no upper age limit. It's kind of ageism in reverse. You're discriminating against young people. But older people, you can run till you're 90, 100, whatever. I, I think that's crazy. Um, 
the uh, Hani Nimmer says, do you think it's possible to really interview Donald Trump? Do you think he would ever agree to do a sit down with you? Have you ever reached out? No, I've not reached out because I don't think he would ever agree to sit down. With me. Maybe I should reach out. Maybe it would, I don't know how much value it would have. I suspect if I did an interview with Donald Trump, if he ever agreed and he wouldn't. And I talk in the book about his tactic of dealing with interviewers, which is the gish gallop to overwhelm you with BS, lie after lie after lie and beat you down. Um, but the book explains there's ways to push back. If I ever did get an interview with him, I think it would last about 90 seconds because he would just get up and walk out. That's the problem, right? He just, he just wouldn't stick around because he's, so, he's such a thin skinned snowflake. And you see it, there was a clip that's doing the rounds on social media that four years ago this week, my former colleagues, my former colleague, Peter Alexander at NBC News, asked him about the pandemic and Trump said, you're a very nasty man. I mean, who talks to reporters like that? Which world leader says you're a nasty man? Are we in the playground? Um, so no, I don't think he would sit down with me, but it would be fun. Um, uh, where do we go? Uh, Jasmine Al-Gamal says, congrats on uh, Zete. Oh, thank you, Jasmine. Uh, are you hoping to influence policymakers or the general public? And what do you think is the most impactful way to change bad policies as an individual ana analyst, uh, media contributor? If that is the uh, Jasmine Al-Gamal, who I think it is, uh, she is a fantastic media contributor and has been very strong on TV uh, in recent weeks in the UK and elsewhere. Um, what is the most important way to have an impact on, I definitely want to have impact on policymakers. I want Zateo to be a, a media organization that challenges the mainstream, but is very much of the mainstream. We don't want to be fringe. The whole point is to have impact. Some people on the left, they think it's great to have no impact, you know, to be out, outsiders. And outsiders have a role to play, but I also want to impact the people in power. That's what I've always done. Um, and I do want people to take us seriously. It's why some of our contributors are going to be so valuable to us because they're such high level people in certain walks of life. And therefore, yes, I do want people in parliament in the UK, in Congress in the US, in the federal government, in the United Nations, in the South African government this week, to be paying attention to what we're doing and to be able to be held to account over their policies. Um, Hadjar Hamai says, could you kindly share your mental self-care routine? Whew, having difficulty keeping the will optimistic these days, witnessing this much immorality and failure of political immorality from the right and failure of political imagination from the left. What do you do? Do you moisturize? Uh, I don't moisturize. I should. My wife tells me I should. Um, the In terms of mental health, it's been a traumatic few months for a lot of us. Um, watching this stuff. I, I, I gave a speech recently where I said we've become doom scrollers extraordinaire. We are on our phones, on Instagram, and in between you know, cat videos and funny clips, we're watching children being removed from the rubble, uh, people with limbs lost, widows weeping for their dead husbands. It's horrific to watch a genocide being live streamed to your phone. But the way, uh, the way I get through it is twofold. One is to remind myself that whatever we're seeing, there are people going through much worse. Put, put ourselves in context, like hashtag first world problems for those of you watching in the first world. People in Gaza are actually having to live through this genocide, not just watch it on social media. And number two, I have hope. Right. I, uh, I, I, I can't lose hope. To quote Cornell West, I'm a prisoner of hope. I may not be optimistic. Right. Hope is not optimism. You can believe everything's bad and going to be bad for a while, but still have hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. That to quote Archbishop Desmond Tutu, there is light despite all the darkness. That's what keeps me going. And that's my mental self-care routine. I probably need a better one. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, Ali Raza Shahnami, Shahnami says, Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Mubarak to you too. Do you think the recent speeches by Biden and Blinken on Bibi to implement ceasefires are meant to pacify their base? Kind of, yeah. A, a lot of the shift in the Democratic Party rhetoric and the White House rhetoric has been in response to the uncommitted movement in Michigan and elsewhere. Um, looking at the polls, seeing that they're trailing in a lot of polls to Donald Trump and a lot of the base want a ceasefire. They're not actually advocating for an actual ceasefire. It's, it's, it's kind of... It's very, uh, I don't want to say gaslighting, but it, it, saying ceasefire when you don't really mean ceasefire, you just mean a kind of a pause while people restock their weapons and you send in a little bit of aid and then you carry on killing again. No, we need a negotiated, immediate, permanent ceasefire um, so that Gaza, the people of Gaza can be saved. And let's be honest, even a ceasefire tomorrow morning will not save tens of thousands of Gazans who are now already in the midst of a famine. A famine, it's not imminent famine. Famine is underway in parts of Gaza. Uh, people are starving to death. It's, it's one of the worst tragedies and disasters of our lifetime. So uh, we need more than just rhetoric from American, British, French, I won't say German leaders, because Germany is even worse than any other country right now. But from Western leaders, we need more than just rhetoric. Um, so uh, Sami Islam van der Lip says, what advice do you have for fellow British Muslim journalists? Hoping to break into the industry at such a difficult time with the industry shrinking, mass layoffs, 
yeah, maybe I'm not the right person to ask about breaking into mainstream media right now, given I just quit mainstream media and started my own thing. But look, one piece of advice I would always say is don't give up, right? Have a thick skin, uh, be determined and don't give up. Um, the people who don't want us to succeed, they want us to give up. They want us to beat us into submission. And we definitely need to um, be, be tough and not accept the first refusal. And that applies to any job, not just journalism, but in journalism, if you're a Muslim, you have to be extra thick skinned. Uh, Sammy, sorry to not have a better answer than that. Um, Ahmed Charles says, what has your favorite moment been while starting Zateo so far? My favorite moment was day one, when I'm very cautious and small C conservative when it comes to things like this, you might be surprised to hear. I was like, we'll get a few hundred subscribers. It'll be great. And that'll be a win. We got tens of thousands of free subscribers and thousands of paid subscribers, literally in the first 48 hours. And that was great, not just from an egomaniacal point of view, oh, massage the ego, but it was such a vote of confidence from people around the world to, that people who have followed me for years to say, they trust me, uh, you all want to support me, and you all want this, right? There is a gap in the market. We need an independent alternative media platform. Um, we have loads of questions. Uh, my team are telling me right now that we have way too many questions. We only have three minutes left. I'm going to zoom ahead. Ali Reza Shanami. Oh, I already answered you. Who's your favorite football club? Liverpool FC. Um, um, anonymous attendee. How can we prevent the sale of Gazan land in the US and Canada? We have to protest, peacefully protest. We have to make clear wherever this is happening, that's illegal. It's against international law. Um, where we are... I watched your discussion with... Abbas Mirza says, I watched your discussion with Piers Morgan. Notice his concern for women in Afghanistan after the US withdrawal. I found it surprising that this concern wasn't extended to the plight of women in Gaza. Good question. Uh, people in the West selectively pick which conflicts we care about. Some people have criticized me, some Afghans saying, do you not care about the women in Gaza? I do. I just don't believe that the US military presence was helping the women of Gaza, not long term. Our presence there made things worse, I'm sorry to say, and we can't stay there forever. Um, and, you know, people point to the plight of Afghan women and people suffering. Well, they were suffering while we were there for 20 years. In fact, we killed a lot of those Afghan women, American and British forces. Um, uh, Somebody asked, do you think it's helpful to have a debunked segment? That's one of our new segments on why criticism is anti-Semitic. Yes, at some point. Although if, you're, if you want to know right now, Rahul, go to YouTube. There's a one and a half hour or whatever debate from Intelligence Square that I did in London a few years ago on whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And I oppose that motion with Ilan Pape, the Israeli historian, and we won. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, let's see. Uh, Muhammad Agha says, Muslims, we've seen that Muslims relying on one political party is fraught with the risk of being ignored. Democrats ignoring Muslim concerns for the last five months in Gaza. What would need to happen so long-term Muslims have influence in both political parties beyond giving tons of money? That's a great question. Um, we have a two-party system in the US. And really, it's just two, two parties can provide us with a president, with majorities in Congress. There was a time when the advice was, look, join both parties have influence on both sides, and both parties have things to offer. Muslim communities, that is. Right now, one of the two parties is completely unhinged. It's white supremacist adjacent. It's full of climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers, election deniers. I'm not sure how much space there is to influence that party. I'm not sure brown people, Muslims, are welcome in a party that's led by the likes of Donald, Islam hates us, Trump, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, right? So that's the problem right now. So there is no easy solution. I don't see how we can exercise influence. What I would say is just stay engaged. Muslim, non-Muslim, black, white, young, old, stay engaged. Don't let people push you to the margins. Don't let people tell you you have no value. Don't let people tell you your vote doesn't count. That is my one piece of advice, separate to any partisan advice. Um, Arib Nasir asks, how do you plan to maintain independence from corporate and money influence? Very simple, Arib. You guys are giving me these easy ways to plug. You guys, you guys keep me independent from corporate uh, and financial influences. Because if you fund Zateo, if you and your friends and families and colleagues and communities fund Zateo, then I don't need to worry about advertiser influence. I don't need to worry about uh, getting more investors. I don't need to worry about selling out to a corporation. I can keep Zateo independent and we can actually produce journalism that is free of those malign financial influences from everything from big pharma to the gun lobby to banking to whatever it is. Um, oh, okay, let's end this. We're out of time. We're going to end with, um, oh, actually, Kathy very quickly asked about ceasefire resolution supported by the US, rejected by China, Russia. I said it earlier. It's not a ceasefire resolution. It's not a real ceasefire. Like, we can't twist the meaning of ceasefire to mean something else. Um, and uh, T. Kida, who asked one of the original questions, let's end with the second question for T. Kida. What's the difference between a soft launch and a proper launch? Thank you for asking that, because some people aren't aware. 
The soft launch was just supposed to be us going, hey, we're here, we exist. Here's an email address, here's a link. Do you wanna subscribe? And we thought a few people would do it. What we didn't expect was 150,000, nearly 150,000 people in the first few weeks. We didn't expect this overwhelming response from you guys and from the media and from politicians. We've really made a mark without actually fully launching. The full proper launch in mid-April will be my weekly streaming show, which is modeled on my old show, MSNBC, the interviews, the monologues. We're gonna have a new podcast twice a month. You're gonna love some of the, uh, the guest hosts that I do that podcast with. We're gonna have contributors bringing in written op-eds, uh, email newsletters, video essays. We're gonna do some really interesting stuff. I can't tell you all, but we're gonna have a lot of content and we're gonna be all singing, all dancing, full-time uh, media company. And I hope you will think that this was something I really appreciated supporting. I hope you will carry on supporting us this year and beyond. I hope you'll get your friends and family to support us. And um, please do send us feedback, info at zateonews.com. And please do look out for your email inbox. Well, look out for your post, because we are gonna send the signed books to those of you who signed up in the first few weeks. Don't know when that is, probably not for a couple of months, but bear with us, it's coming. And bear, look out for the emails, which will tell you um, when we're gonna do smaller town halls, uh, you know, 40, 50 people so that we can actually chat in a different way. But thank you for all your written questions. Appreciate you guys making it today um, on a Friday. We're gonna put this video up for everyone to watch and see what they missed because they're not founders. Um, and soon we're going to be bringing in all sorts of paywalls uh, for some of our content. That's going to be part of the full launch. But you guys are never going to be affected by paywalls because you're founding members. You're my favorite members. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.